join me in welcoming to the podium, wherever it went to, uh, Dr. David Hilson to talk about risk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Well, good afternoon, everybody. That's um, a very generous introduction, Harry. Thank you, too. Um, it's great to be here and the inaugural uh, session of your risk faculty for the Institute. Um, I heard there are thousands, tens of thousands of members in the Institute and something like 30 members in your uh, risk faculty. Does that seem right to you? That's for New South Wales. Okay, but even so, 30 risk specialists in New South Wales. Uh, we've got some work to do, haven't we? And uh, part of it, I think, as Harry said, is understanding what our contribution really is, uh, how we can add value to the business, how we can help our colleagues to, to do uh, their work more easily. Some people call risk management the business prevention department. You, know, you can't do that because it'll all go horribly wrong, be careful. Um, and I think that's, uh, and, and if you're a risk specialist, you'll know that's absolutely not characterizing uh, our contribution to the business. Um, Formula One drivers have discovered that brakes help you go more fast, go faster. Brakes help you drive faster because you have a safer car and it's easier to stop when you need to, so you can actually go faster when you don't need to. And uh, so actually risk management is offering us uh, a facility like that to understand where the boundaries uh, and constraints are and then we can, within those constraints and boundaries uh, with those risk appetites and risk thresholds now then perhaps our businesses can just go that little bit faster, be more competitive and create more value. Um, so I would encourage you if you're a risk specialist and you know others who are also interested in risk management who are not part of the faculty, uh, then do uh, get them involved and uh, come to events like this, uh, sign them up. Uh, because risk management is really our opportunity to, to make a difference. Um, as Harry said, I've been involved in risk management for 25 years. I started when I was very young. Um, that's a joke, by the way. Um, you can laugh, it's fine. I know it's being recorded, but you know nobody will know who laughed, but please do. Um, and if you can't manage to laugh, then non-verbal is good. You know That helps as well from this end. Um, so I've been doing this for a very long time, and the reason that I do risk management is because it works because risk management genuinely helps us to understand the things that could drive us off track, that could affect our ability to achieve our goals. Our ability to succeed is directly proportional to our ability to manage risk effectively. So we really make a difference, or at least we should do. And that's what gets me out of bed in the morning, uh, whether it's as a speaker or as a consultant or trainer or um, so doing some of the thought leadership work that I do. It's to move that risk discipline forward and make it even sharper, even better focused, uh, so that we can make more of a contribution to our businesses. And, and not just business, um, but to wider society at large, uh, and perhaps even in, in our communities, um, because there are risks everywhere, as you know. What we're going to do today is talk about risk in projects. Um, it's a very particular application area. Uh, some of the concepts I'm going to introduce to you uh, may not be new. Uh, maybe they will. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, but they don't just apply in the projects arena. So you will, if you're not interested in projects, you will find some aspects here uh, which are applicable elsewhere. I plan to speak for about 40 minutes or so and then have some time for questions um, and then Harry might have some, uh, something else up his sleeve towards the end if, if needs be. So let's uh, get on with the material. I'm going to make these slides available to you as well so you can take notes if you like, but uh, the slides will be available through, through the Institute. Um, in terms of risk management for projects, um, there's a lot out there already. There are standards, as we know, ISO 31000, but not just, that's our generic risk management standard. There's a, a 62198, an update of, of IEC 62198 coming out, which is risk management in projects. We've got a UK government standard, we've got Canadian government standards. Uh, there's lots of standards, and there's a lot of activity here in Australia, as you know, uh, in terms of, uh, and New Zealand in the, in the standards area. So we have risk management standards, we have risk professional bodies. There's an Institute of Risk Management, in the project world, there are project risk specialist bodies. Uh, we have Institute of Operational Risk. We have uh, you know, all sorts of different specialist risk professional bodies. Um, we do have a body of knowledge, so you know, people understand what risk is and what risk management is and the processes and so on. And there's quite a good infrastructure to support that in terms of books and training courses and um, academic courses. So you can do doctorates and, and degrees in risk management. We've got consultancies, uh, we've got tools and, and so on. So um, the question that Harry raised I think is quite interesting. Is risk management a profession? I don't know how you feel about that when you go down to the pub at night or you're at a dinner party and somebody says, what do you do? And uh, first of all, dare you say, you know, I'm a risk management specialist, I'm a risk manager. Uh, if you dare to say that, then what follows? Oh, is that insurance? Is that health and safety? Uh, what exactly is that? What do you do? 
And then the question is, how do we answer the question? Um, in terms of profession, there's a lot of work on what a profession really is, and Harry touched on some of those things. But one of them is public recognition. We all know what an accountant <coughs> is, and a doctor, and a priest, and a lawyer, you know, which are the, the traditional um, uh, uh, professions. Why don't people know what a risk manager is? Uh, I think maybe we're not so close to being a profession as we think we are. Um, so you know, maybe pe people see us a bit like this, a bunch of cowboys who try and scare people into giving us their money or their business. It'll all go horribly wrong if you don't come and, come and talk to me. Come and talk to me and I'll, I'll make it all go away for you. Um, and sometimes our advice isn't really well, well focused either. Uh, you know, we ought to be able to do better than that, don't you think? The world's a nasty place, mind how you go. Um, so you know, we've got some work to do, I think, in terms of persuading people that risk management is a contributor. Um, if we look at how, projects, um, how risk management is practiced in the project arena, it's quite widely accepted. Um, all of the project professional bodies, the Project Management Institute, uh, the various associations, the Australian Institute of Project Management, for example, will include risk management within their bodies of knowledge and will include it in their certifications. Um, we basically know what it is and it's practiced right across uh, industries, different project types, most countries. Um, I've worked in uh, 48 different countries and most of them will have been practicing some kind of risk management. So you would expect with this kind of long history and, and, and good understanding of what it is and, and how it works, that everything should be okay in the world of risk in projects. Is that your experience? Um, here's the standards <coughs> groups data, the chaos data, which has been tracking project performance uh, since 1994. Um, and they divide projects into either succeeded, they've met all of their objectives, failed, they've met none of their objectives or challenged, where they've met some but not others. And um, there's some, some detail here, but you'll see we haven't really progressed very much in the last 20 years. Um, we still get um, a fifth of our projects failing outright. Um, nearly half of our projects are failing in some aspect, and only around a third are actually succeeding. So, so something isn't going right in the world of projects, and risk management is supposed to help us. Risk management, in theory, is the thing that drives us to success whether it's in the world of projects or in the world of business uh, or in, in the wider world. Why is that? Well, because projects, like the rest of life, are risky. Actually, uh, risk is embedded into the nature of every project because projects are unique and complex. They're based on dependencies and assumptions. They're trying to create something that's never been created before within a series of conflicting constraints. Uh, very often things change during the lifetime of a project and projects are done by people. Every characteristic of a project is risky. Um, and so project risk management ought to help <coughs> us to identify and, and to manage that risk. Um, risk management should help us achieve our goals in projects because it focuses on our objectives. We'll come back to this a little bit later on. Um, but a risk is an uncertainty that will affect an objective. You can't do risk management unless you know what your objectives are. And because of that relentless focus on objectives, risk management in projects should help us. It's always asking the question, what are you trying to do here? And what could affect you? So that should be helpful. It's about being proactive. I talk about risk management being a forward-looking radar. It scans the future out there and says, what's coming towards me? And how do I need to prepare myself and position myself as the future gets ever closer? And so we're doing things in advance, being proactive, not waiting for them to turn up and then trying to do, decide what to do. So we have thinking time. We get space to think about how we're going to respond, not react. And that's really important. And if we have a risk process that involves the whole team and all of our stakeholders, then it helps us to focus on the main issues. What are the risks that really matter? And how are we going to address them together as a team? So risk management really should help, but projects just keep failing and businesses keep being challenged and going out of business and, and so on. So what's going wrong? If risk management is supposed to help us and yet projects are still failing, then something's wrong. So what is it? Is there something wrong with the theory of risk management? Is there something wrong with uh, the practice of risk management? Is there something wrong with the people side of, of how we actually do it and how we understand it and, and our relationships and so on? Well, the answer is probably yes, yes and yes uh, to, to all of those things. Uh, but I'd like to focus on one area in particular this afternoon, and that's the way we think about risk. Because our thinking determines our behaviour, and actually our behaviour determines our culture. So if we're thinking about risk culture, which some of us are, culture comes from repeated behaviour, but behaviour comes from thinking. So we need to think right 
about risk, otherwise we're not going to be able to manage it well. And I think there's a lot of woolly thinking about risk and risk management out there, even amongst us who call ourselves risk specialists or, or risk professionals. And, and I think if we don't think right about risk, it's bound to be ineffective. Um, risk management manages risk. So what is risk? And we, dare we start at, at such a, a basic thing? Well, let me start here and, and move you know, fairly quickly um, to think about what we mean by risk so that we can get our concepts and <coughs> our thinking straight um, and then maybe uh, it will help us to decide how to make it work better. Um, if we went round the room and asked for a definition of risk, I think we might find a number of different views. There are different opinions on what risk really means. And it's a nice, short, simple word. It's in public use. Everybody uses it. But do we mean the same thing? If we don't mean the same thing, how on earth can we move towards being professional or to operationalizing the management of risk uh, in our businesses and in our projects? We've got to know what it is. So let me start with that. We're talking about new concepts for managing risk. And let's start with the concept of what we mean by risk. Um, so we'll start with something fairly basic. Um, what's the difference between risk and uncertainty? Are they the same thing? They're synonyms, they're interchangeable, or is there a difference? Well, you know there's a difference, of course, but what is the difference? Um, all risks are uncertain, but not all uncertainties are risks. So there has to be a difference, right? Risks are a subset of uncertainties. But which subset? How do you know? There are billions of risks out there in the universe. If you have a risk register, it has a limited number of things in it. 10, 20, 50, 100, um, but it won't have billions. So somehow you've filtered that almost infinite world of uncertainty to create a world of risk. But how did you do it? There's a mathematical answer to do with known and unknown probability density functions and generation of random numbers, which isn't very helpful. Um, there's a philosophical answer, which is to do with different types of knowledge, um, which also isn't really very helpful. Um, so in the project world, we try and approach these things quite simply. Um, so here's a simple distinction between risk and uncertainty. Three words. And if you don't remember anything else about mm -hmm. new concepts in risk management, these are the, th the three words mm -hmm. to remember. Risk is not the same as uncertainty. Risk is uncertainty that matters. Uncertainty that matters. Now, that's really important. First of all, there are lots of uncertainties that don't matter. Is it going to rain in Kazakhstan tomorrow afternoon? Don't know, don't care. It's, it's an uncertainty. Might or it might not. I don't, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to write that in any risk register or spend any time thinking about it, worrying about it, or deciding what to do about it. What's the exchange rate between the Russian ruble and the, and the Chinese yen going to be in 2040? Don't know, don't care. You know, there are uncertainties that matter. And how do we know what matters? Anything that matters is something that could affect achievement of our objectives. Objectives define what matters. So in projects, it's going to be our timeline, our budget, our scope, our performance requirements, our, our um, assumptions and dependencies. All of those objectives define the things that matter. So if there's any uncertainty out there that could affect one of my objectives, I need to know about it. I need to write it down. I need to tell people. I need to think about it and decide how to manage it. So uncertainty that matters, that's the key, which, which is going to help us. That's the kind of filter that will help us turn uncertainties into risks which means we've got two things to think about. If it's not uncertain, it's not a risk. And you will, I'm sure like me, see lots of things in risk registers which are not really uncertain. People put problems in risk registers or issues or constraints or requirements or things that they wish weren't true but they are true, they all go in the risk register. Why is that? Usually it's because we haven't got anywhere else to put them. And we know they're important, we know they need attention, we haven't got anywhere to write them down, so we, we feel at least if we put them in the risk register, somebody will pick them up and, and do something about them. But they're not risks. And the problem with putting certainties in the risk register is that they hide the real risks. And actually, the risk process doesn't work for things that aren't uncertain. It's, it's designed to handle uncertainties that matter. So then if we put certainties in the risk register, we hide the real risks, and the risk process doesn't work, everybody says, well, risk management isn't working for me. That's because you put non-risks in the risk register. So it has to be uncertain, and it has to matter. So we find that risk has two dimensions, and I'll come back to that again in just a moment. So risk has, if you ask how big is the risk, we've got two questions. How uncertain is it, and how much does it matter? Now, we might just say, we're talking about projects here, 
but different things matter to different people. So what matters to some project team member who's a, a technical specialist and has some, some piece of the project to work up and he's quite interested in the technical solution and the design and how it all works in here and some things matter to that which may not matter to the overall project manager who just cares about the deliverable. And things that matter to the project manager may not matter to the sponsor. And things that matter to the sponsor may not matter to the user. And things that matter to the user may not matter to the end client. We actually have a hierarchy of risks because we have different things mattering to different people. We actually have a hierarchy of objectives. We have strategic corporate objectives, program and portfolio objectives, project objectives, technical objectives. Each level of objective has a level of risk associated with it. Which means that risks need to be owned in different places. Who should own a risk? The person it matters to, the person who owns the objectives. So much comes out of these three words, uncertainty that matters. There's another thing which comes out of here which we won't have time to talk about, at least I don't intend to talk about, but you can ask in the questions. And that is, if we ask the questions, how uncertain and how much does it matter, the answer to both of those questions are subjective, are perceptions. You might think something is really uncertain and I think it's, it's quite clear. You might be really, really critically concerned and it really matters to you and I don't care at all. So who's right? And how do we decide? And the whole issue of subjectivity and personal bias and personal preference comes out of these three words as well, which means that risk is not just about process, but risk is about people and about psychology. And we need to think about that uh, in, in our approach as risk specialists. So a lot of things from just those three words. And uh, as I say, if you just memorize those three words and use those and think about those, reflect on them um, as you think about your work and what you're doing, it might be helpful. So, um, if we're looking for a definition of risk, a formal definition, not just that sort of idea of uncertainty that matters, it has to have something to do with un uncertainty, something to do with objectives. The ISO standard, I mentioned ISO 31000, has a very neat, short definition, just these few words, risk is effective uncertainty on objectives. Not too bad. Um, in the world of projects, we've got uh, this group here, the Association of Project Management, which is our UK professional body, perhaps the leading uh, independent national pro uh, professional body in project management. In our body of knowledge, we have a def definition of risk which says the same thing, but with more words. So risk is an uncertainty. It could be a specific event or a range of other things. The key thing is it's uncertain, so it might never happen. If it does happen, it matters, because should it occur, it will have an effect on achievement of objectives. So we're saying the same thing, but with more words. So here we have the connection between risk and objectives. First key concept. What about a, another key concept? We're talking about uncertainty on objectives. Um, what, are, what kind of uncertainty are we interested in? And here I'd like to use some technical words. Um, if you've had more than one glass of wine, uh, you need to kind of pinch yourself at this point because uh, it might just get a little bit kind of, what did he say? Um, but as Harry said, the idea is to try and explain these things. Simply, there are a number of different types of uncertainty that we need to think about, not just uncertain future events, things that might or might not happen in the future. I think we have a big job to do in terms of explaining to people and remembering ourselves what kinds of uncertainty matter in our projects, in our business, in our lives, uh, in, in the world at large. It's not just things that might or might not happen in the future. There are other types of uncertainty we need to think about, be aware of, be prepared for, and handle through our risk process. And you'll see that the APM definition didn't just say a risk is an uncertain event. Events that are uncertain are risks, if they matter, but it also includes uncertain sets of circumstances. What does that mean? Non-event uncertainties which are also posing a risk to our project or our business or our objectives. The definition of risk is any uncertainty that matters, any uncertainty that if it occurs could affect our objectives. So what sort of things does that cover? Here's the, here's the, the jargon words. Uh, one suggestion is obviously possible future events, things that may or may not occur in the future. And we might call those stochastic uncertainties. Now st stochastic is just, don't panic, it's a, it's a word that comes from the Greek, which just means uncertain. But it tends, tends to be used uh, of events that either happen or don't happen. So we're going to uh, run a trial, and the trial might fail. And if it fails, we run a second trial. But if it doesn't fail, we don't run the second trial. So the second trial, the repeat trial, is a future event which may or may not occur. 
so it represents a risk to our timeline, a risk to our budget. Um, we're working with a contractor, uh, with a supplier, and they provide key components to our solution, and they may go out of business during the lifetime of the project. They may not. It's an event in the future that might or might not happen. If it happens, it matters. And obviously, we're very familiar with this idea. Most risks in our risk register, apart from the, the non-risks, most things that really are risks are of this type. And we think about what could happen. Okay? Now, I won't say much more about this because this is where most of our thinking is. But there are other types of uncertainty that matter, not just events in the future that could happen or not happen. All right, are you with me so far? Do you want to know what they are? Or maybe you do know. Here's one. Uh, it's called aleatoric uncertainty. The Latin word alia means a dice. The thing with a dice is it's got six sides. They've got dots on them, one to six. And you throw the dice, and you will get one of the answers, one, two, three, four, five, six. You just don't know which one. Okay? So there's a limited number of possible answers, and when you throw the dice, you will get one of them, but you don't know which one. This is not an uncertain future event. You will get a result when you throw the dice. You just don't know what it is. It's not the same as things that may or may not happen. You might say, and, we, and the, the sort of non-jargon word for aleatoric uncertainty is variability. When we do a, a task on our projects, a design task or a, some kind of implementation or a trial, we expect our people to have a productivity level. There will be a target productivity level and an actual productivity level. We hope that the actual will be the same as the target, but it might not be. It could be slower or it could be the same, or it could be faster. When we go out to buy equipment from overseas uh, at, at, uh, using a foreign exchange uh, currency, then the exchange rate could be higher or it could be lower than what we'd expected. When we dig a hole in the ground, we're not quite sure what we're going to find. We might find nothing. We might find archaeological remains. We might hit some pipe. We might find buried treasure. We're going to dig the hole. Digging a hole is not an uncertain event. The question is, what happens when we do it? or how long, how long does it take us, or how much will it cost. So we have variability around key characteristics of things that we're going to do anyway. This is not the same as things that might or might not happen in the first place. Are you happy with that distinction? And it's a different kind of uncertainty that matters. So when we're doing project plans, if we're talking about risking projects and we have uh, schedules or schedules, um, whichever you say here, I can't remember, um, and you put in a, a planned duration and a planned uh, budget and a planned resource requirement, it could be more or less. So we do three-point estimating, minimum, most likely maximum, don't we? Don't we? We should. And that's to handle this kind of uncertainty, not this kind of uncertainty. Which just as a byline, if you ever do quantitative risk analysis using Monte Carlo type models, you need to take account of both of these and they're different. So we should have estimating uncertainty as well as specific discrete risks, both represented in our risk models. I hope yours do. OK, any other types of uncertainty that matter? Not just stochastic events that happen or don't happen, but aleatoric variability of things we plan to do that could be more or less in some way. Well, there is another type, and that's known as epistemic uncertainty. The Greek word episteme means knowledge. So epistemic uncertainty is about things that we're not sure that we know or that we don't have enough information about, things that aren't really clear. And uh, the non-jargon, the, the sort of simple natural language word for that is ambiguity. Ambiguity is when some part of what we're trying to do is not well understood. We have a lack of knowledge and that introduces uncertainty. That uncertainty is not an event, it's not in the future, we've got it now, I don't know quite how this piece of kit will work. I'm not entirely sure what the customer wants or what the requirement is. I've got some sort of uh, a proposal from a key supplier. I'm not really sure how we're going to interface uh, their bit of the solution with ours. There's lack of knowledge. It's a, it's a present uncertainty, and it matters. And it's going to be handled in a different kind of way from these kinds of uncertainty. And so we need to understand it, record it, think about it, size it, prepare for it, include it in our risk registers. All right, happy with that? Non-verbal is good. All right, one more. And uh, this one has a, has a smart name as well as a, a, a kind of an ordinary name. Uh, the smart name is ontological uncertainty. Have you ever come across that one? Ontological uncertainty, um, sometimes known as unknown unknowns, uh, sometimes known as black swans. 
Um, and un an ontological uncertainty is to do with concept. So ontology is, is about the, the thinking of origins. It's about our mindset. It's about our worldview. It's about our conceptual framework. And ontological uncertainty are about the things that you can't even imagine, the things that you can't think. They're outside of your frame of reference. And of course, the problem with those, and we say blind spots, um, the problem with those is that I can't list them for you. Because as soon as you say it, you've thought it. And if you thought it, it's one of these. These are the ones that we can't think of, which means we can't say them until they happen. And when they happen, they're not risks. So there's a lot of garbage talked about black swans. Um, for a start, some people just think they're uh, uh, low probability, high impact risks, which they're not. There's a whole sort of uh, theory of black swans which is much broader than that. Um, but I think people use, they throw the term black swan around without really understanding what it is. Uh, and they expect the risk process to take care of it. Um, I was just saying to somebody earlier on, you know, black swan, the, of course the abbreviation for black swan is BS. I don't need to say anymore, do I? <laughs> um, so you know, when somebody says to you, does your risk process take care of black swans or the unknown unknowns? Well, how can it? How can it? Let me ask the question in a project context, how many unknown unknowns are there that could affect your project? I don't know. <laughs> That's the point. There could be none, and there could be a million. And they could all just be queuing up to happen tomorrow, or actually there may be nothing to worry about. And we don't know. That's the point. So what can we do in a risk process? We can't write anything in the risk register. Something might happen. Well, how do you respond to that? Now we can do, it's not that we can do nothing, because this is an uncertainty that matters, so we have to manage it in some way. And there are answers to dealing with black swans or unknown unknowns, which are to do with resilience, which are to do with flexibility, which are to do with disaster recovery and preparedness, which are to do with um, you know, all of those issues around, around organisational readiness. Um, so we can be robust and flexible, we can build in a culture of, of, of uh, the ability to change into our organisations and projects so that if something happens, and we don't know what it is, then we can handle these kinds of blind spots when we suddenly see something. But it's not really risk management. Um, it's really taking disaster recovery or business continuity thinking into the world of projects. And it's, it's slightly different, but it's something we need to think about. So I think the world of risk management needs to be much, much broader. It's an, uh, any uncertainty that matters, if it matters, it needs to be managed. Okay? And any of these kinds of uncertainty could affect your project or your business, or your customer, or your family, or your career, or your life. Okay? And so when we do risk management, First of all, we need to be identifying all of these, not just these, not just the possible future events. Then we need to be preparing for them and assessing them to decide which are the big ones and developing responses, not just to the events. Okay? And the responses, the reason we break them out into these types is not just to appear to be clever and smart and pseudo-intellectual by having smart names, but it's because these things are different in nature and they need to be managed in a different way. Now. Here's a question for us as risk specialists. Would you ever tell a customer or a senior manager, would you ever use those words to a customer or a senior manager? In my risk register, I'm going to divide it into four sections, sir, and I'm going to put the stochastic and aleatoric ones over here and the epistemic and ontological ones over uh, I don't think so. This is for us. This is for our thinking. This is risk specialist thinking, risk professional thinking. It's for us to understand our discipline, our profession, so we can then do our thing and translate that into their language and talk to them about what matters to them. This matters to us. And it matters to us because we have to think differently to pull these out, and we have to act differently to manage them. But we shouldn't really be using this language in our risk communication or risk reporting, because it will drive most people crazy. It will push them away. No, I, I, can't, I don't know what you're talking about. No, just talk about risk. Yeah, well, this is risk. No, no. I don't want that. Give me, give me the risks. Okay, so this is for our thinking, and we've got to work that out. Okay, right. So let's move to the next thing. Uncertainty that matters. These are uncertainties. Shall we think about what matters? And uh, this is something that I think you guys in Australia should be much more familiar with, uh, and our Kiwi colleagues too. Um, when we think about risk being the effect of uncertainty on objectives, 
And we, just, we ask the question, how big is the risk? And one of the questions then is, well, how much does it affect my objectives? Then we've got to think about any uncertainty that matters. Well, let me take that off for a minute. And let's think about this funny picture I found on the internet. You might have seen this. I think the mouse is a really good risk manager. Why is the mouse a, a, a good risk manager? Because he's facing a, an uncertain situation and he is doing some kind of assessment and thinking and preparation in order to make sure that he achieves his objectives. So what has he seen? What is the mouse thinking about? Well, the mouse has seen the trap. And so the mouse is very focused on the trap and doesn't want to be killed or injured. His objective is to stay alive. And so he's done his preparation. He's put his little helmet on. And he's going to make sure that he minimizes or avoids the possibility of getting killed or injured. Very good. And uh, he's a good risk manager. We should be like the mouse because there are traps in our projects, traps in our business, things that could waste time, that could waste money, that could destroy reputation, that could damage value, that could kill or injure people. And as risk people, we have to look ahead and see those things and get ready and prepare and make sure that we minimize or avoid the chance of those things happening, right? That's what we do. So we're like the mouse facing the trap. We have to make sure that we don't get killed or injured. Good. Is there anything else that the mouse is interested in? Is there any other uncertainty that matters in the picture? Well, of course there is, and it's this here. This is another uncertainty that matters. Can I get that cheese off the trap? Because another objective of his is obviously to feed and to grow strong and to have the energy to do whatever it is that mice do, make more mice, I suppose. Um, and so here's an uncertainty. He's got to make sure he gets the, 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 the cheese off the trap, which he might not be able to do. And he's actually got to manage that quite carefully. In fact, what he's got to do is manage two types of uncertainty at the same time. He's got to make sure that he's not killed or injured and gets the cheese. And of course, if he only manages one of those, then he's failed. If he gets the cheese off, but he's fatally wounded and dies in the process, well, he's failed. If he's very, very careful and doesn't spring the trap, but he doesn't get the cheese, then he's failed. He's got to do both. And we are like the mouse in our projects and in our businesses because we don't only focus on traps. There are uncertain things that if they happen would damage us, damage reputation, value and, and cost and so on. Um, but those aren't the only things we're interested in. In the world of projects, we're trying to create value. We're trying to deliver benefits. We're trying to do things that have never been done before. And because projects are risky, there's no guarantee that we'll be able to do that. We can't say for certain when we embark on a project that it's going to work, that it's going to deliver any value or benefits or create anything worth having at the end. That's why we do the project. That's why we need project management. So we can't say for certain we're going to get the cheese out of this situation. And as risk specialists working in projects, we've got to do two things. Stop things going wrong on our projects. Don't allow people to damage reputation, waste time, waste money, upset the customer, all of those things. And get as much value and benefit as possible out of our project at the same time. So if we deliver on time, we don't waste time, don't waste money, don't upset the customer, but we don't create any value, we failed. If we create value, we deliver some benefits, create some output from our project, and then we upset everybody and we're double, double the budget and we're too late for it to, that's failed too. We've got to do both these things at the same time. Now, why we concentrate on that is because there are two types of uncertainty that matter. There are uncertainties that if they occur could have a negative effect on our objectives, the traps, but there are also uncertainties that if they occur could help us to work faster, smarter, cheaper, to get to our goal in the best possible way, to be most effective, to be most efficient. And those things matter. There are uncertainties that help us as well as uncertainties that harm us. Both are important and both need to be managed. If they're uncertainties that matter, then they come into the scope of the risk process. They count as risks, even though they're good. There are good risks as well as bad risks, really. And our ch challenge as risk specialists is to find the best possible way to get as much cheese as possible out of our projects, whilst having the minimum chance of uh, springing the trap. And there's always a better way. And as specialists, this is, we should be advising on this, right? And how do we uh, do it in the best possible way? So, what does this mean for risk? In terms of our definitions, our concepts, we need to embody the cheese as well as the traps in our thinking, as well as in our practice. So, 
Uh, here's a definition from the PMI, the Project Management Institute. Uh, it's a global body, nearly half a million members. Uh, they've got chapters in Sydney and Melbourne and Auckland and so on. Um, and they have a project management body of knowledge with a risk chapter, chapter 11. Um, I was one of the core authors of that chapter for about uh, 15 years or so. Um, and there's a joke in the contents list of the PMBOK um, because for our American brothers, we made risk management chapter 11. And only the Americans laugh, you see. So, um, chapter 11? No, never mind. Um, <laughs> It was a joke over there. It doesn't work anywhere else. It's funny, that, isn't it? Anyway, here's our definition. Um, a risk is an uncertain event or condition. It's the same as the APM definition. It, it's events and other things. It's uncertain, so it might never happen. If it does happen, it matters, because if it occurs, it has an effect on an objective. Good. What about the cheese and the traps? Well, PMI has heard of cheese and traps and actually put it in the definition. Well, we didn't put cheese and traps, but we put these words. A risk is an uncertainty that, if it occurs, has a positive or negative effect on an objective. Now, there's another name for an uncertainty with a positive objective. We call that an opportunity. It might never happen. If it happens, it helps. We're pleased about opportunities that turn into reality. So these are uncertainties that matter. Threats are uncertainties with negative effects on objectives. They might never happen. If they do happen, we're sad about it. We wish they hadn't because they damage achievement of objectives. These are both uncertainties that matter. And so they both come into the scope of our concept of risk and our practice of risk management. And in case you think this is just the Americans in PMI going crazy and doing American things, uh, and you know, just going a different way, um, we have the same sorts of things in other professional standards. Here's the ISO standard. ISO says that risk is effective uncertainty on objectives, footnote, Effect is deviation from ex expected positive or negative. APM says the same thing in their body of knowledge. Again, lots of words, but it includes positive and negative opportunities and threats. This is not weird thinking. This is not PMI American crazy thinking. This is best practice. This is standard concept of risk. The risk includes threats and opportunities, downside and upside, good risk and bad risk. And so we need to manage both. That means that our risk process needs to handle both types of uncertainty that matters. And the question is, nice theory, does it? Now, how many opportunities are there in your risk register? And if there aren't any, uh, then why? Why is that, that you don't have opportunities in your risk register? Uncertainties that matter, because if they happen, they help you to work faster, smarter, cheaper. So you go to the boss with your risk list and you say, I've got a list here of all of the big risks. He says, go away. I don't want to hear about that. You know, just deliver solutions. Just give me things that are sorted out. I don't want to hear about things that might never happen. Anyway, you guys are full of doom and gloom. You're only going to give me problems that might never happen. I don't want to know about that. Well, excuse me, sir, but there are two sections in my risk report. And in this side, I've got all of the things that might go wrong. And there are some, and we've prioritized them. We've thought about them. We've got some actions to make sure they don't, and to minimize them. And then on this side of my report, I've got a whole set of things that might help us to achieve our goals in a more effective way, to save time, to save money, to, to improve performance, to, to uh, enhance our reputation. And along with those, we prioritize them and we've got some actions to try and make them happen. But I guess you don't want to see my risk report, do you? Hang on a minute. Yes, I do. I know there's some things to worry about. What are these other things? That sounds really interesting. And it actually changes the whole nature of the risk discussion if we start talking about things that can help, as well as things that can harm. And as risk professionals, it's our, it's our duty, and also actually it's, it's quite, quite pleasant, to be able to go to people with two lists. Some things to worry about with actions, some things to get excited about with actions. And we really need to do both. If you've only got the downside in your risk process and your risk register and reports, you're missing a trick. You're not helping your projects or, or your organization in the way that you could and should. I think. All right, OK, um, let me move on to something else. We've talked about uncertainty that matters. We've talked about four types of uncertainties, stochastic, aleatoric, epistemic, and ontological. We've talked about two different ways of mattering, positive or negative. I'd like to talk about something which you might or might not have thought about, <clears throat> which I think we do need to think about, and that's the difference between risk and risks. 
At which point I can hear you thinking, he's really lost it now. You know, this is, I, you know, it was kind of a bit of a stretch so far. I think I kind of follow, but this is just like, no, no, what's the difference between risk and risks? Is there any real difference? Is it singular, plural? Well, I think there is a difference. Let me illustrate it from the world of projects. With this question, how is risk seen from a higher perspective of outside the project? Whether it's the project sponsor, or the program manager, or our external client, when they look at the project and they ask you this question, how risky is your project, how do you answer the question? And if you give them the risk register and say, this risk register with 30, 40, 50 risks, prioritised threats and opportunities with actions, uh, this is the answer to the question, how risky is your project? Is that what they're asking? They're asking something different. They're not asking about what the risks are. They want to know how risky the project is. This is about risks, individual discrete things, uncertainties that matter. This is about something different. We might call this overall project risk, which is a different concept from individual risks. So we have individual things that we write down in the risk register that we need to understand, scope, assess, respond to, and so on. And then we've got some way of putting all of that together to talk about the risk of the project. You might talk about the risks in the project versus the risk of the project. Now, I think this is different. This is a different concept. And if we look in the bodies of knowledge, you'll see that there are different definitions. So we've got a definition in the APM body of knowledge of this thing called overall risk. It's not about uncertain events or sets of circumstances now. It's about the overall exposure of stakeholders to the consequences of variation in outcome. It's about the accumulation of some individual risks and all sorts of other types of uncertainty. Anything that matters to the overall project deliverables is part of our overall project risk. And they're different. PMI says exactly the same thing. It has a practice standard for project risk management. It says overall project risk is the effect of uncertainty on the project as a whole, not the same as individual risks. So there's something different to think about here. We need to be thinking about what is the riskiness of my project, which is different from all of those risks that I write down and try and deal with. And just in case you're not so interested in the project world, this actually applies right throughout the business. If we're talking about uh, what's the strategic or corporate risk exposure of our organisation, is it the same as the content of the corporate risk register? No, it's not. In the corporate risk register, you have 5, 10, 12, 20 individual risks, and the board want to be interested in, and so do our other stakeholders. What is the overall risk exposure? How do you convert one into the other? We need to know how to do this. So for the project manager, uh, back to project level, the project manager is accountable for managing the overall risk exposure of the project. And to do that, he deals with the individual risks within the project as well. So that means that as project risk people, then we need a language and a process and techniques for dealing with overall project risk as well as individual project risks. Does that make sense? <coughs> Um, so it's not just done at the higher level of enterprise risk management or program risk management. This is part of the job of managing risk on projects. And we've got to work up some kind of language or techniques or approach to deal with that. Now I'd like to suggest to you a way of thinking about it, and we don't have time to go into lots of detail, but maybe this just might be a start. I call this implicit versus explicit risk management. I'll demonstrate it at project level, but it, it applies right the way up the risk hierarchy from projects to programs, programs to portfolios, pro portfolios to departments or functions, departments and functions to the corporate. So at every level we can do implicit, implicit, explicit. By implicit risk management, what I mean is the overall riskiness of the project, which is driven by its structure and scope, content and context. What's in the project? What is the project? And our decisions about that will affect the overall riskiness of the project. We don't manage individual risks, we think about what the project is. And every decision you make about the type of functionality or performance to include within your project, about what assumptions you think will be true and what constraints you will accept, everything you do uh, in terms of our, our performance targets around these questions affect how risky the overall project is. We're not thinking about individual risks at all. We're thinking about the characteristics of the project. This is implicit, it's built into the nature and the decisions about the project itself, 
which will influence its riskiness. Okay? Once we've done that, and we've defined our project with a given structure, scope, content, and context, in other words, with a given level of overall risk, then we take it into our explicit risk process, which we're used to doing with identifying, assessing, developing responses, and, and, and implementing, and so on. And then we deal with the individual risks within the project. So we've got, we've got the kind of the big picture, what are we doing here? And the smaller detail picture, how are we doing it? And these are two levels of risk management, two levels of thinking, two levels of implementation. And if we're risk specialists and our task is to support risk management on projects, we need to help our stakeholders, our project managers, our customers to think about risk on, these, on both of these levels. And we need to have thought about it ourselves first. And we need to have clear processes in our minds for dealing with those things so we can help them through it. Okay, I think I've probably said enough um, to, uh, to confuse you, um, or hopefully not confuse you too much, but to give you some things to be thinking about. This thing of risk management is not easy. That's why it needs risk professionals, risk specialists. If it was easy, everybody would do it, and uh, then we'd be out of a job. And actually, that might not be such a bad thing. And part of our role, maybe, might be to work ourselves out of a job so people can manage their own risks without the kind of specialist support that we offer. But at this stage in the development of the discipline, and I would call it a discipline and, and perhaps not a profession, um, we've still got some things to help people with in terms of the concept of risk and the way the concept affects the practice, in terms of what uncertainties that matter we include within the scope of the risk process that we talk to people about. So when we facilitate risk workshops, what kinds of things are we expecting to get out of it so we can help them to write those down? If we've never thought about aleatoric or epistemic or ontological uncertainty, then we won't help them to think about it, and those risks will remain unseen and unmanaged. So we've got a job to do, and I think uh, it's not, not necessarily an easy job. It starts with that concept that risk is uncertainty that matters. Risk is any uncertainty that matters, not just future uncertain events. Um, that includes good things and bad things, opportunities as well as threats, and we need to make sure that we manage both of those things through the risk process. And we also need to be thinking about the next level up of riskiness, of risk, in addition to risks, and those discrete individual things that we manage through our explicit risk management process. Both of these things are important. And if we want to be you know, uh, leading, our, uh, helping our organisations to manage risk properly, we need to be doing these things too. Um, so here are the questions for you. I, mean, I know you're supposed to ask me questions, but here are some questions for you. Is this what you think about risk? Um, you know, we're talking about new concepts. So are these your concepts? And if not, why not? Uh, do you do it this way? Because you could and you should. And if you want to do it this way, what has to change? You know, we can come to these sort of seminars and sessions and watch the video and read the books and think, oh, that, I never thought about that before. And then off you go back to work this afternoon and back into the routine and just do what you've always done. And nothing changes. Um, here are some new ideas which are important and which we need to engage with and grapple with and reflect on and think about uh, because they ought to affect our, our behaviour. Um, project risk management is important because it's a contributor to the success of projects. And projects contribute to the success of our businesses and businesses create value for society and the wider world. So this is important. We have a number of areas to think about. And what we need to do is to think about them. And what we need is people who are prepared to just kind of step out from the normal profession, the normal routine, and say, right, I'm going to have a go at this then. You know, I'm going to go out of that door and do things differently. I'm going to try in my organization, including some of these new concepts. I might need to break some rules. And I might need to do something that hasn't ever been done before. But if you don't do it, Who's going to do it? You know, I'm trying to do it in my world and with my clients and through, through our Risk Doctor network. But you know, I don't work with you. You work with you. And so you have to do these things. Otherwise, they're not going to get done. We really need some people to step up to the mark and to say, OK, this is not good enough. You know, we're not doing well enough in our risk management in projects. And something needs to change. And I'm going to make it happen. Um, so if we're the risk faculty of the institute and we're the risk specialists, then we're in the front. We have to do something different. Um, let me finish with, with two quotes. Einstein said this, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. What he really meant to say, I think, which is perhaps a little easier to understand, is that if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. 
And the question is, is that good enough? Are we happy with what we've always got in the world of risk management? Is it delivering results and delivering value? If not, something has to change. And Gandhi said something which is much wider than just risk management, but it applies to us too if we're thinking about change. You must be the change you wish to see in the world. Don't leave it to me. Don't leave it to speakers and writers and you know, people who, who run institutes. You're the ones on the ground engaging with your projects and business. You've got to be that change and embody it and make it happen. It's not impossible. It is difficult, but it's worth doing. So that's the challenge I'd leave you with. I hope you found that interesting and useful. Um, all of those ideas are explored in this little book, um, and there's a voucher on the table, gives you 35% off. Get it on Amazon, get it on Kindle. Um, but I'm not here to sell books, I'm here to enlarge your thinking and to help you to do a better job. Please join me in thanking Dr. Hill. Thank you very much.